Now one of the, the first hindrance to mental clarity is loss, greed. Now this, this is the kind of problem that arises from dwelling on the desirability of something. You become obsessed with wanting something. Dwelling on its desirable, looking forward to anticipating pleasure, some kind of sensual, sensual pleasure. This is called lust. Now, the, a lustful mind is one that uh, hasn't developed the discriminative faculty very well. You, one uh, is uh, so obsessed with the pleasant qualities of something, somebody, that one uh, uh, just want, wants to, to have it. One longs and anticipates and plans and schemes, or just fantasizes. So we keep the mind busy. We have to create all this. If you stop thinking, then the lust won't arise. It will, will, will fade away. As long as you think about it, then of course it will, uh, the, the lust will be, uh, keep being a problem for you. The one way of dealing with lust is to just recognize how the mind works. That if you add something, some, some impulse arises, some attraction, and then you dwell on it, then of course the lust, that's what lust is. But if you stop the mind from dwelling on the, what you want, what you desire, sustain your attention, keep the mind from getting caught up in fantasizing, anticipating, hoping, expecting, creating, then the, then the uh, lustful <coughs> habit will diminish, will fade away. If you can't, if your mind's still busy kind of thinking about things, then instead of thinking about the desirable qualities of somebody, think more about them in, about the undesirable qualities. For example, if uh, if you think of some, feel a sexual desire for somebody, and you uh, dwell on their beautiful hair, eyes, pearly white teeth, <laughs> <laughs> flashing eyes, and lovely skin, we see the we see the outer surface as desirable. Well, the the lustful mind dwells on doesn't see any of the any of the undesirable qualities. When you feel lust, you don't you don't notice the the uh, wart, the scar, the freckle. So when we ordain, one of the kind of teachings we get when we ordain, and the, the preceptor says kesa, the kesa which means hair of the head, loma is hair of the body, naka nails, danta teeth, tajo skin. Hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin. To say that. What does that mean? What are we saying this when we ordain? This is a reflection of, uh, for the uh, brahmacharya life. That when we see hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, this is this is when is what we tend to be attracted to in somebody else when we just look. Uh, the, the beauty of somebody. But if we start looking at it separately, more discriminatively, then the lustful impulse diminishes. We see just hair. Hair, when, it's, when, it, when we just look at hair, we don't feel uh, lust. But in, if it's all connected and arranged in a nice way on the, with the, on the skin and the, and the teeth and the nails and so forth, we we feel this uh, attraction. And if you find somebody's hair in your soup, <laughs> that doesn't arouse love. Not to mention a tooth or a piece of skin. <laughs> <coughs> Tends to arouse aversion, doesn't it? <coughs> 
<laughs> then as you get beyond the, the hair of the head, hair of the body, nails, teeth, and skin, it gets even more, uh, less, less attractive, you get into, say, um, blood and lymph and blood vessels and nerve endings and stomach and spleen and bladder and heart, lung. Small intestine, big intestine, stomach, these kinds of things, fat and pus and mucus. <laughs> these are the things. So, this is what we call a reflection on that which is not attractive. That which does not attract us, arouse, which is not lust arousing. And when we see, now these are all, we all have these things. We, we all have these organs, hearts and livers and spleens and fat and snot and pus and blood and all these things. But uh, we don't reflect on it. When, when, we, when we're lust, we just see what lovely eyes, what lovely teeth, lovely hair, lovely skin. You don't think about the liver, spleen, the guts, skeleton. So that this is uh, another way of using the thought process, the discriminative ability, to kind of break through the tendency toward dwelling on how desirable somebody is or another human being is. It's not to create aversion to the human being, but to arouse dispassion. There's a difference. We're not, we're not doing this to think how disgusting somebody is. We're not trying to arouse disgust or aversion, but dispassion, meaning a coolness of mind, not one that is caught up in, I, I have to have, I want, I need, I must, the obsessive, the obsessive qualities of lust, but the coolness of dispassion. So it's a skillful use of our thought process rather than for fantasy of how wonderful or anticipating, hoping, and planning. We use our thinking faculty for uh, dispassionate reflection. Now, there's, there's two ways with dealing with lust, I've found. One is through this way, through dwelling, through being more discriminative and uh, breaking through the, the tendency to dwell on the, on the beauty, being fascinated and, and obsessed with beauty, or just stopping the mind from creating anything whatsoever. Just being attentive. Just noting the feeling of, of lust, the, the heat in the body that rises, but not creating anything around it, not following it with any kind of action, speech, or thought. You just bear attention to it. The second hindrance is the hindrance of aversion. <coughs> so that we can dwell on and we can we can be sitting in meditation and feel incredibly negative and averse, angry, hateful. And you can't, I mean, when your mind is full of hatred and anger and aversion, and of course you have no concentration, your mind can't concentrate. But because of, no, we, have, we tend to feel guilty about the aversion, in our background here, Christian Jewish background, we tend to feel very guilty about uh, hatred. So that anger, we, we, we don't know, we don't know what to do with it. And we, we feel guilty about it. So we tend to develop a very complex system called guilt, which we feel we hate ourselves for feeling hatred. <laughs> this is called guilt. We, we hate ourselves 
and we are averse to ourselves for hating somebody or for being angry. So this is completely, we're, we're, we're rather complex creatures. So it's not just hatred, that kind of aversion to something or that, but it's also the aversion to the aversion. Now, because of this, we are uh, investigated. What you're averse toward, you tend to, to want to annihilate or get rid of. So that there's a, the immediate reaction is to repress, try to get away. I'm just terrible and then try to do something else, to think about something else. So, in this way, if you're one who's trying to annihilate or get rid of anger, hatred, or suppress it, out of consciousness, then you must allow it to be fully conscious. So the anger, repressed anger and hatred that you've kept in your mind all your all your life, say, you must allow it to become a fully conscious hatred. Which means you must bring it up, because your tendency, say, might be to repress it, to push it away, to get rid of it. So you Instead, a skillful means is to really hate. Sit here and really hate, fully, completely, consciously hate. <laughs> but it's not directed, in, it's not malevolent hatred, is it? It's not in order to, to cause suffering to anybody, but it's a, what we call a, a release of hatred, a purification of the mind in which Hatred can only cease when we understand it, and when we allow it to go to cessation rather than just repress it. So we have to consciously allow hatred to become conscious in our mind, not just react to it with aversion and suppression, annihilation. So sometimes we sit and when we find ourselves becoming very averse, or a lot of maybe memories coming up, feeling of bitterness, disappointment toward relatives or husband, wife, society, children or whatever, this kind of thing, the, ten the tendency to suppress it, try to get rid of it, we must patiently bring it up so it becomes fully conscious. I used to do, I found this in a monastery, wanting to get rid of hatred was the, was the main problem, was the guilt and the, and the fear of hatred. And then being a monk, thinking that you should love everybody, trying to be a saint, wanting to be saintly and love everybody, and then having this tremendous burden of guilt over uh, feeling a tremendous bitterness and hatred. So that, then I found the skillful means of releasing this was to consciously hate. So I'd bring up, bring it into consciousness. I'd think, really, really investigate it. Think about hating everybody I could think of. Willing, quite willing to just hate. Think adversely and listen to it though. Not believe it, not believe it. But to listen to my mind. He did this person, he did this, he did this to me, and he did that to me, and she said this, and he said that. <laughs> yeah, it sounds ridiculous after a while if you really listen. If you carry hatred to absurdity, it's, it's, it's quite amusing. My mother never really loved me, but my father <laughs> I never was given a proper chance. Nobody ever really understood me. <laughs> Listen to it. Bring it all up into a conscious form. But uh, listening to it, not believing it. Believing it is nobody loves me and I've been mistreated by life. And you start believing that that's really what's happened. But listening to the grudges, the bitterness, the disappointment. So that you know what they are, they're conditions of the mind. That 
you can consciously accept now into consciousness and let go. It's a letting go, a kind of cleansing of the mind, rather than just, oh, I shouldn't be that way. I shouldn't, I shouldn't hate people. After all, you know, got to, should love everybody. Instead of, said to hold these grudges and I can't forgive people, and I, I'm terrible. So we start hating ourselves. So we listen to our self-hatred. Just listen to, if you if you have a lot of aversion to yourself, just bring that up. I'm worthless, I'm stupid, I'm no good, useless. <laughs> <laughs> so then you can hear the, the mind, go, the, the conditions of the mind, the repressed feelings of aversion and make them fully conscious, and it's a way of letting them go. You have a perspective on them, you see them clearly, and then you can let them go. You're not trying to just get rid of them. I shouldn't be thinking like that, that's disgusting, and then, and then repress it. But recognize that there's a lot of our lives, there's been a lot of repressed anger. An aversion because in, uh, in the Western society, I know like America, uh, <coughs> Americans are very idealistic <coughs> people, and so that they they come from a high-minded idealism about what a what a man should be, it was an ideal, and then the way we are sometimes we never really. We, we're, we're afraid of. We're afraid that we 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 feel a, a tremendous lack of in, or a tremendous inability to to live up to that ideal. So then we start thinking of ourselves in very negative ways because it's very seldom we can ever really live up to the standard that, that we feel we should live, be at all the time on the ideal level. So we tend to feel terribly guilty about our weaknesses, about our failures, about our fears, cowardice, lack of energy, aversion, all this. We feel terribly guilty and, and uh, averse to ourselves for not living up to this kind of high standard. This is an ideal. We recognize that an ideal man, ideal woman, is just a standard kind of, it's not the, not the way one can live on a kind of permanent basis. <laughs> our humanity, our human condition, our earthbound condition, makes us uh, have to adapt to all kinds of situations that we can't predict on the ideal level, that we have to endure, can learn from. So, on the ideal, uh, you can, you know, you think, of how you should be as an ideal man or woman. That's one thing, isn't it? But then life is, is seldom, I mean, life is, is a constantly changing uh, kind of energy so that we, we, can't, uh, we can't predict what's going to happen. So we have to learn to endure and learn from trial and error. But because of of this uh, lack of understanding, this ignorance, then we tend to create a lot of guilt, remorse, aversion to ourselves, towards the world, because of our lack of understanding of it. So now, who can understand it? So this hindrance of aversion, aversion because it's something we tend to, to, uh, to not like and want to get rid of, then we must bring it to us, make it a fully conscious aversion, listen to it. So you can, like if you find uh, just um, a, a lot of anger towards husband or wife, feeling that uh, they don't understand you, or that they're feeling discontented, then listen to it. Listen to the aversion rather than trying to figure out what's wrong with you or, or the 
or your spouse. This, that's enough, just listen to the aversion, so you know exactly what it is. Maybe it's, maybe there's grounds for it, but there's no need to make anything out of it. That is to let it go. Then to expect the world, your spouse, your parents, friends, children, to conform to all your desires. Chitters, I used having mm. been a head monk of a monastery. Sometimes I just I see a version arriving for certain people in the monastery. They'd be causing trouble or dif being difficult. But I say, why do they have to do that? Why can't they be like everyone else? Why must they make problems out of everything? Why can't they be more mindful, more considerate? Why can't they be more sensitive? Why can't they really practice like I've been teaching? <laughs> I'm teaching, trying my best to teach them, and then they don't even put forth any effort. They just laze about. And then tell them, run away. They don't even tell me they're going, they just run. <laughs> <coughs> Living on arms ungrateful, insensitive, and so forth, go on like that. You see also, anyone that causes, that causes you frustration, or, or is difficult sometimes, you can really, you can think, wish they'd go away, wish they would run away. <laughs> <laughs> Listening to this, to this aversion in my mind, and I meditate on it. Someone giving me a lot of difficulties and find myself reacting negatively to it all. I listen. And what it comes out as, what I discovered is, is that I want all of you to act in a way that never upsets me, that always gratifies me and makes me happy, not to do anything to give me any kind of fear, doubt, and worry, that you should live your life solely for my benefit, <laughs> and conduct yourselves in the way that I want, just so I won't have to be upset. <laughs> That's what I realized I was saying, when I was, how I was acting. I want every monk, every nun in this monastery, every lay person, to act in a way that doesn't upset me. That's pretty stupid, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if that's what I want, it's useless, isn't it? To expect as a, everyone around me to act in a way so that I won't suffer and be uh, and get uh, nervous or upset by anything. <coughs> when I really discovered that, then I began to to, uh, I began to be much more tolerant, lenient, more willing to allow for people to, to be as they are, and feel as threatened by idiosyncrasies or eccentricities in people, or their uh, rebelliousness, or their <coughs> stubbornness, whatever. I didn't, I wasn't taking it personally or as, as a threat to me anymore. I began to relax. And not and give a lot of space to people to and be able to reflect better to those people than just to kind of browbeat them into behaving themselves. <laughs> See, so that the relationship became much better when one began to allow people to work through their problems rather than browbeating them into kind of conformity or getting rid of those that wouldn't conform. You aren't suitable for being a monk, get out of here. <laughs> you can allow people to be as they are because you don't demand that, that they be otherwise. You realize that that's where they have to be at this time. So that's a good reflection for people themselves, isn't it? Then you can really help them because 
just browbeating and chastising and blacking people to death and to conforming is just fear conditioning them again like animals. They just they might behave themselves because they're frightened or they want to please me, but not out of real wisdom or understanding of the problem. So that then it became clear that uh, and, and it became much easier to be a teacher when I wasn't taking it all so when I wasn't feeling threatened or frightened by what was going on around me but that was that insight came through reflection on my own mind and what what I you know that what was what was really bothering me was was fear fear of things going wrong fear of doing something wrong fear of of being of somebody ruining something or causing me a lot of of distress or upsetting the community there was a a fear of also a kind of paternal protectiveness the kind I can see what fathers and mothers must feel like wanting to protect the family from anything harmful or subversive so it wanted to if you saw somebody causing a lot of trouble or disillusionment in the monastery you wanted to to get rid of them get rid get out of here we, do, we don't want you here because you're disrupting it all a kind of desire to protect father kind of feeling of a father wanting to protect his family from from strange and unusual subversive influences so that the kind of I was attaching I was becoming a father Reflecting on that, you can see the kind of um, uh, traps one can get in. Because that sounds quite reasonable, be father, kind of protect the, the monk, the nun. But it's quite admirable. People say, oh, he's a, he's a really good abbot. He's very protective, loves his family very much, and takes care of them. And that's admirable. But that's also a trap in the sense that that. Uh, identifying as a father and being protective has is a, has a strong karmic result, a sense of dependency and and also of excluding those who don't who who you don't particularly feel fit into the family group. Or in a monastery, say you're not you're not creating a family. You're not creating. You don't want a kind of in group of of close friends uh, and exclude others who you don't think belong you don't you think might be cause problems or be disrupted so that you you, you open the Dhamma up to anyone who comes and asks whether you, you particularly uh, whatever your feelings about them doesn't matter <coughs> But then the, the gauge of this is the amount of suffering you're having in whatever you're doing. Parents, how much suffering do you have with regards to your children? Kind of protectiveness, wanting them to behave themselves, wanting to not, not fear of making mistakes, fear that you might do something wrong, blaming yourself for, for not being able to, to always be the best and the wisest. So, <laughs> the suffering of parents is, you can reflect on it, the kind of attachment, positions that you attach to. And all these attachments bring us to this, this suffering. See? So, the amount of suffering you have is that you reflect on that. So, there's one, the first one is lust or greed. The second is aversion. Those are the two extremes, the grander passions. Desire for something and desire to get rid of something. Then the, the following, the three uh, following hindrances, <laughs> getting more as, as the kind of greater passions diminish in your life, great amounts of lust and hatred, 
and you purify the mind, you find, purify the mind, you find the more kind of tedious, deluded, deluded states of mind become more conscious. <laughs> like torpor and dullness. Third one, torpor and dullness. You, where before you might have had some pretty interesting lustful <laughs> pretty pretty passionate hatred and jealousy <laughs> suddenly you're stuck in this kind of dull state, boring dreary really really become this is where a lot of monks disrobe is when you get into and they really have to face dullness and torpor because that where where lust and hatred you get a lot of energy from it outside you, 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 you get a lot of vitality like sex, sexual fantasy gives you a lot of energy really you're feeling dull and you start fantasizing about sex in your <laughs> <laughs> If you're dull and <coughs> depressed and, and, and hatred arises, you're that so and so out. <laughs> <laughs> when I'm really angry, I can really feel alive. <laughs> <laughs> really sharp, clear. <laughs> indignation. I had I was on my tendency I, I have a lot of indignation. I get indignant. <laughs> Dare he say that? Disgusting, despicable. <laughs> I suddenly feel, and it seems so righteous too. Somebody does something really, that you know, quite annoying or stupid or horrible or whatever. How dare he? It's terrible. <laughs> I'm so righteous, so indignant, so alive, and I'm and I'm so right too. <laughs> <laughs> And that has a lot of energy connected to it. <laughs> now I notice like some some monks at Chitra tend to uh, become, uh, dwell a lot, uh, get a lot of energy out of being indignant about things. Okay. You know what that person said, and you know what he's been doing? <coughs> He's been going off and smoking cigarettes in the forest. <laughs> You're in a dull state. And so then you see somebody doing something wrong and you can get indignant. How dare they? But you watch that in, in the... just observing how, how you do get energy. Because fantasy, lustful fantasy, and and uh, indignation, aversion, <coughs> I mean, passionate anger, <coughs> hatred, and all that, you get a lot of energy out of it. And some, and then when you sink into dullness and torpor, this is a very unpleasant state. We don't like this because you you're just existing in a kind of dull, dreary state of mind. And life seems hopeless, endless, like an endless desert. Nothing in the desert but just kind of sand, boredom. Not, a, not anything interesting to look at. Not anything tantalizing. Not even anything to, to get indignant about. It's weariness, dullness. And so we can, we can sink into that dullness and just not put any energy because our, if our energy is always coming from greed, from lust or hatred then when those things aren't operating then we don't have any energy we tend to so then we have to start bringing up energy from from our own mind don't we this is where you start bringing the energy into the, into the moment where you hold the posture you exist with the dullness. You you allow the dull. You investigate the dullness, the sleepiness. Alert to it, not with it, 
uh, sometimes we, we're so averse to the dullness, we just want to get rid of it. So we just sheer kind of willpower, we hold ourselves up straight in order to conquer the, the torpor. But then you go like that for a while, too much energy, and you <laughs> <laughs> go from one extreme. <laughs> you get in the habit. You've seen monks do that in Thailand. You, get, you see them sitting up, and suddenly they just <laughs> fall down like that, <laughs> swing back, back up again. <laughs> so it's it's that's not very mindful. It's not reflective. You're not working with the dullness. You're just trying to get rid of it. You know, I hate this dullness, and I'm going to. I'm not going to give in to it. I'm going to annihilate it. So there's aversion to it, isn't there? You get the energy to do this extreme out of aversion to the dullness. That's all, and then it's gone, and then you fall over. So you have to use a much more subtle way, more wise reflection on dullness and sleepiness rather than just the aversion to it and trying to <laughs> annihilate it through an act of willpower. So when when you do get dull, you 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 consciously you you note dullness and sleepiness. You endure it. You work with it. You keep the energy. You try to hold it, the body straight and and when it and you keep working with it gently and patiently until you begin to uh, let go of dullness, allow dullness and talkersness to, to go <coughs> rather than just repress it. Otherwise you're just repressing it again, which means it keeps coming back. Then the fourth hindrance is equally unpleasant, restlessness. <coughs> and that's where you have a kind of just restless. You just feel restless. Mind. Uh, you just. You don't. There's no passionate hatred or greed. You're not. Certainly not dull. But you're, you're just. You know, it's, I want to go somewhere. <laughs> 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 Terrible restlessness. Anxiousness. <laughs> Agitation. And so we tend to try to repress that also. But the more you try to repress it, the more <laughs> agitated you get. So in order to concentrate it, you don't you don't put any more effort into the posture. You just hold the posture and patiently endure, it, watching the restlessness, observing it with a kindly attitude, kindness, patience. Willing to endure the unpleasantness of it without just reacting to it, flying away by it. Willing to endure it forever if need be. Incredible patience. And then the last one is doubt. Doubting state of mind. This is a great problem with people. They're always caught in these doubts. Doubt about themselves, doubt about what they should do, doubt about the practice, doubt about Buddhism, doubt about the teacher, doubt about every, anything, right? Everything. I don't know if this is, if I'm doing it right. I don't know what. Maybe I'm not capable. Maybe this isn't the right way for me. Maybe I'm, maybe this is uh, beyond me. Maybe I should investigate Christianity more carefully. Maybe I should. I think maybe Mahayana might be my idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about Ajahn Tomato. <laughs> what do I do next? Should I concentrate on my breath or should I? <laughs> <laughs> he said, didn't he? Once you get a certain level of concentration, you're just going to bear it. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> doubt. <laughs> doubt. So you know that. <coughs> Doubting that state of not knowing something. Now, uh, the mind, we, we, when we're used to knowing things, we tend to avoid doubting, or as soon as doubt enters the mind, we become we try to find the answer. <laughs> if we want everything spelled out, I do this, then I do that, then I then I know exactly what. To do. <coughs> but if you leave, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. We feel very uncertain, unsettled, insecure, and we don't like that. But we not we want definite answers. Everything kind of defined, clear, clarified, outlined in detail. This stage, the next, and so forth. Where am I now as a meditator? What have I achieved? Have I attained anything? Or maybe I haven't attained anything. We'll go and ask Venerable Sumato, have I attained anything? used to go and try to squeeze out information out of Ajahn Chah, was hopeless. (laughs) 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 All our kind of deceitful ways of trying to get him to say something about our attainment. (laughs) (laughs) Because we would like to know, you know, I have we expect him to know what we've attained. <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? So that this this kind of doubting, expect, thinking that somebody knows something that you have to know, and so forth. You bring this up into consciousness. Now this is a very skillful means, the doubting mind. You can use, a, like they use a koan, who am I? Who am I? Mind goes quite empty, doesn't it? I'm Venable Tomato, isn't it? I know that already. <laughs> I'm not asking that question to get that answer, am I? I know that answer already. Who am I? <coughs> so the question for that moment, if you if you're really aware, you you see the end of a question you ask is emptiness. The mind goes quite blank there for a a moment, doesn't it? Who am I? Emptiness. For that moment, the the mind, there's nothing in it. And then then you start thinking, oh, I'm, I'm, well, what does it mean, who am I? What am I supposed to be? (laughs) Starts going on again. So then you're, who am I? And then you listen to that, that emptiness to the point where there's no thought. Keep concentrating on that, bringing that up, and being fully aware of that point where the mind is quite empty. When we talk about the empty mind, people, what does that mean? I don't think I've ever experienced emptiness. <laughs> I mean, I talk about shunyata. I mean, what do they mean by that? Because mind goes quite empty when you try it. What do they mean by shunyata? But you don't, you're busy looking for an answer, so you don't notice the emptiness, do you? <laughs> you think that there's an answer, some kind of answer for that. And you feel very uncomfortable. What does he mean? That's, certainly that's not it. So you've got to figure it out, know it. I mean, I should, should read more books about Zen or something. <laughs> you read all the Zen books and you still, mind goes completely empty and you just still don't know me. I don't understand what the Zen Buddhists are talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what those Zen Buddhists are talking about. I've read all those books and talking about emptiness and the sound of the of the clap of one hand and what is your original face? <laughs> Stupid kind of question. <laughs> What's the point of it? Because we're looking for something. That emptiness is 
is uh, so uh, people that want death definite def everything defined and clarified and and have a lot of faith in answers and concepts, of course, find emptiness rather threatening. But when our minds do go empty sometimes, quite naturally, we, and we don't know what it is, we become frightened. We suddenly become terrified. Something, something wrong. Sometimes we have to fill it up with something. <coughs> Eat something. or Watch television. Do anything. But the mind is, is uh, if it were filled all the time, you'd be crazy. You'd be locked up in an institution, a babbling idiot, just going from one thought to the next without any respite. But when you're, but because we, we, we come from ignorance rather than from wisdom, we don't know emptiness. Because we, we're so busy, we're so attached to uh, concepts and extremes of a conditioned extreme as an identity. So we feel alive, we feel really alive when we're when we're moving toward a goal. I'm moving onward to the goal. I'm getting somewhere in life. We feel alive then. I'm really somebody important. And then when you get to the goal, so what? <laughs> Then you have to have another goal to feel alive again, or have a cause to fight for. I'm going to dedicate my life to, to education. Or have a cause to fight for. I'm going to dedicate my life to, to education. The problem with the world is there's, is there's illiteracy. And if everybody's educated, then that will I'll dedicate my life towards education, right education. So they've done that here in Britain. A lot of that energy. Everybody's educated now. <laughs> Look at us. <laughs> Are we that much the happier for it or better off, really? Except we have more to complain about. We know more. <laughs> the, the rights of the minorities and the working class. I dedicate myself. It's, it's because uh, the aristocracy and the upper classes have deprived the lower classes, the working classes, of their rights and privileges. It's unfair. We can become indignant and hate, hate the, uh, the upper classes and fight for the rights of the working classes. It gives us something, dedicate a life that we're important. But now the working classes have rights and all this. <laughs> no, are we that much happier for it? I mean, working class that, that has rights and, and privileges and middle class and upper class. So we, we find causes to, to kind of get excited about, to feel alive about. And we don't know the emptiness, so we have no perspective. We, we, we feel disappointed when, when things don't work out. Or when, when you start from being very idealistic and having causes that you dedicate your life to, they'll end up becoming quite, dis being very much of a disappointment, disillusion. Because you don't, you haven't really got, uh, have, haven't really reached the source of the problem. Human ignorance, one's own lack of understanding. So our lives, can, we can fill up with all kinds of things. But also, we can empty out the mind. So, meditation is a way of letting go of things. Not to, not to have, it doesn't mean that we no longer do things for the welfare of society. <coughs> but it means we no longer attach to these ideals as ends in themselves. 
meaning we have a much clearer perspective and understanding of, of life than when we're just blinded by a particular cause that we've attached to. When you're attached to an ideal, sometimes you have you you, you just do the most stupid things, thinking that it that it's right what you're doing because you lack perspective on the situation. So the great idealists have done very harmful things with good intention because they have no perspective, no clear understanding of the situation. They're just imposing their ideals on everything without understanding what the real problem is. So in this, in the, in, when, you, when you can abide in emptiness, it's like having space to observe how things are rather than how you believe them to be, how you hold them to be with your ideas. It's like I was telling you about the monastery, rather than believing my opinions and views about others, when you go into emptiness you allow, you have give a space to people to change. You're not always holding them to being a certain type according to your particular bias or prejudice. Now when I, when I allow you space in my mind, that means that you're not forced to react to me always in the same way. If I, if I perceive you as a certain type of person and treat you like that all the time, you tend to react like that to me all the time. The kind of habitual game that one plays with other people. You just reinforce each other's personalities and habit patterns with each other. You, and with that you you believe that this person is kind of permanently this way. But when you have an empty mind, then you you know that your perceptions of people are just temporary, are just changing conditions and not really what they are, and not person really, but a, what they might might be temporarily is a changing changing thing. So you can for for example, if you say I meet you for the first time and you're in a bad mood. Something unpleasant has happened to you and you're very upset. And so I meet you and you're you're in a depressed and rather grumpy state. You're not very nice. I go away. He's not a very nice person. I don't want, to, don't want to have to meet that person again. I go home. I, somebody says, "You see, Joe Brown." I said, "Oh, <laughs> impossible person. I, I don't want the likes of that around. <laughs> Hope I never have to meet that one again." So then. A few days later, I meet Joe Brown. By this time, he's all right. He's feeling good. But I, I'm still holding on to my perception. Here comes Joe Brown. <laughs> <laughs> so I turn down a side street to avoid <laughs> And because then Joe Brown sees that I've kind of a particularly avoided him, so he feels resentful. So the next time I see him, he, he's carrying that around. <laughs> so he's being, he's pretty, being, and pretty nasty to me again. <laughs> it goes on like that. It? Kind of. So we can, we don't allow people to change. We don't give them space. Anymore. We hold them to an image, a type. We treat them accordingly. And we then, when if, if I treat you as, as a certain type, then you and you're ignorant, you don't know what's happening, then you tend to react. <coughs> if, I, if I think, I think uh, that you, uh, I've got to inform you about what's wrong with you, that you're so stupid you can't see what's wrong with yourself. It's up to me to tell you, set you straight. So I come at you really heavily and say, now the problem with you is that and then you're kind of pushed into a position of reacting to that.
So then I, I think, well, I've really told them what's wrong with them. They better straighten up. <laughs> so we have a relationship of, or a, a, a way of perceiving each other that is always coming from, we tend to approach each other always from those positions. Dominance or a dominant position or a passive position or whatever. We don't allow change or uh, what's appropriate to time and place. Like when we re-roofed Chitra's house last year, doing all that labor on the roof, do a lot of manual labor, doing things that I don't know how to do. I couldn't very well be Abbot up on the roof, could I? Mm. Going around giving directions, telling them what to do, being the boss. Because the time and the place was one where <coughs> I, I was the one who didn't know what to do. Didn't, pos- didn't know how to do any of that kind of thing. So, according to time and place, then I had to be the manual labor. And the, and the Anagarikas that knew how to do it were the bosses. <laughs> it's adaption to time and place, isn't it? You can figure out what is what has to be done and how to do it. You, you're not holding on to a position with anyone, but you are uh, skillfully adapting to what is appropriate, what needs to be done. So the the conventional positions of senior monk and anagarik and all that are, you know, these are conventional forms we use for convenience, but not to be absolutely, absolute standards and, and, and totally inflexible. So we adapt. When, when, we, when somebody knows something more than us, then we follow them in, in whatever has to be done. Obvious, isn't it? But if we're attached to the idea, well, I'm the abbot, I have to be the abbot under all conditions. I can be a real tyrant, a real pain in the neck to everybody. <laughs> <laughs> so its ability to adapt, you know, wisely reflect time and place, what is appropriate, what needs to be done, the people that one is with, Now this takes wisdom, and also spaciousness of mind, to have that ability to reflect and to see one's own limitations in these situations. The threats that one, one feels threatened, maybe, by certain people or situations. You can observe that. You can be aware of when, when you feel that, that you're being threatened, when there's fear. That's an important point of, of recognition. Not to analyze it, but just to recognize the things that threaten one, or that one is frightened of. The assumptions one makes about oneself and and the situations one is involved in. These assumptions that one can operate from can really be blind. So life is, is a, a constantly learning thing, not after years of meditation, one still is learning all the time, because it's a change, the thing, things are changing, not like you, that, that you find a place where nothing changes. You do, you can abide in emptiness, and watch, and no change, and then adapt accordingly. So that's what we mean <coughs> by the empty mind. Now doubt is is the way to the emptiness of the mind. If you if you use doubt rather than just be caught in doubt, and then, of course, being educated, intelligent people, your mind easily gets caught into doubt. Doesn't doubt seem terribly important? Got to know the answer to this is very important question. Really got to know it is. They say, watch. The, how can I just watch the doubt? Getting out of this, I've got to know the answer. We believe in the importance of maybe the doubt. 
very important Tao. It's not just a niggling kind of nothing Tao. It's <laughs> world-shaking Tao. <laughs> and it's a Tao that comes from a koan, eh? the sound of the clap of one hand. Oh, we can handle that one, maybe. Because <laughs> that's a contrived Tao, isn't it? A really contrived Tao, but a, a really important Tao. <laughs> got to know, got to find out the answer, rather than abiding in the emptiness of not knowing. Now when we can abide in that emptiness, is that, that's why we use doubt, because it, it takes you to emptiness, you bring that emptiness, make that in kind, kind of, seek that emptiness, that state of not knowing, of just, uh, of that empty state of mind, where there's, no, where there's not knowing, and you can work with that. Things take care of themselves. The answers to the questions come, come, come quite naturally when you have the space for them to come in, rather than just arbitrarily choosing some kind of, making some decision, just for the sake of a, a feeling that you have to make a decision, so you just choose this one, just to make a decision. You might make the wrong decision. <laughs> But if you can abide in emptiness, then one usually makes the right decision. Because the answers come quite obviously, if we're patient. Those are the five hindrances. The more extreme passions of greed and lust, and the first one, the uh, aversion and hatred, then the three kind of deluded, delusion, delusions of dullness and torpor, restlessness and doubt. And these are things to learn from. <laughs> See, these hindrances not as kind of things you have to get rid of in order to... That's what it sounds like in the books. You read these books on Buddhism and you, you get this impression that you get rid of these five hindrances, you've got samadhi. That's <laughs> 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 not a very skillful way of, of re regarding it. Getting rid of the five hindrances and get samadhi. Is it? The attitude isn't right. The five hindrances are like teachers, they really learn a lot. A lot of wisdom comes to us through understanding these hindrances. They're like, they're like tests for us, ordeals that we must learn from, the five ordeals. I mean, an ordeal is something, a kind of test, isn't it? You have to go through an ordeal, meaning like some kind of difficult very difficult situation in order to prove yourself, in order to gain the wisdom and knowledge to, or manhood. They used to put young men through ordeals before they would consider them men. You had to go through an ordeal before you were allowed to be called a man. We stopped and so now we just don't grow up at all. <laughs> 50-year-old boys. I've <laughs> uh, tried, you know, put, put the young men through ordeal. Uh, but these are the five ordeals in meditation. They're not to be just pushed aside, uh, just repressed and neglected and resented, but to be wisely considered and, and experimented with it and investigated, carefully considered. Because it does take that, doesn't it? You, you can't just annihilate sloth torpor, sleepiness, just by ignoring it. It just keeps it just keeps it just keeps at you all the time until you learn the lesson from it. The same with restlessness and doubt. It just keeps haunting you wherever you go, following you around. Greed and, and hatred will just keep haunting your life 
following you around everywhere you go, no matter wherever you go, these things will pursue you till you understand them. So that these are the ordeals of meditation, five ordeals, called hindrances, but that, that makes them sound like they're something we should get rid of rather than, than learn from. Now when you learn from that, there's a tremendous amount of wisdom comes from, from that. You can actually know what to do with these, with these things arise in life. You, 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 you gain this wisdom to be able to, to understand these kind of things, these things that will happen to us all throughout our lifetime. So it's in this, this, this time now eh, that you have this kind of interest in meditation and this willingness to practice that you can uh, learn from these five ordeals. Once you learn the lesson, then you know, you know what to do with them. Is it clear? You also learn how to reflect and investigate so that when you find in your life you're getting caught up, you're making a lot of problems for yourself, or life seems to be incredibly difficult or dreary or whatever, then you reflect on it. You must be attached to something. You're obviously trying. You're obviously attached to some some idea, or or you you're, you're not you're not really understanding what the problem is because you're making problems out of it, and so you reflect on on it rather than just blaming or blaming life or blaming somebody. So now if you take a short break <laughs> because the future and the unknown is the mystery what is a mystery? We don't know what it is. When we don't know, then we, then we, when then we seek to know something that, that we've known. Memory, sentiment, souvenirs. <laughs> Rather than, say, walking into the unknown, looking at the unknown. So that in meditation, you see, we need to know both the known and the unknown as being the knowing so establishing ourselves in the present <coughs> aware now the teaching is that all that arises part of the way is not self so death is nothing to is nothing but uh, the ending of a, of a body what we call death and yet we, we've the, this idea of dying is frightening because it's what we don't know. What happens when I don't have this body anymore, where am I? What happens to me? When this body goes, what, what, what happens to me? <laughs> if that's all that dies, then what happens to me? Unknown, isn't it? We can't, we can't imagine. We have maybe maybe perceptions that we're given, like go to heaven, live happily ever after, live in a state of eternal bliss, join the Father in heaven, play a harp forever, <laughs> radiate light. <coughs> or maybe go to hell. Maybe I'm, I'm just one of those people that they send down to the pits. <laughs> Never know since it's unknown. And, or maybe I'll be reborn again, some dreadful thing. But what we can know, what we can know is that we don't know the future. 
We don't need to know it. Let the future always be just the mysterious unknown, the infinite potential possibility for pleasure, pain, or peace. And as we, uh, as we let go of the fear of the unknown, we find peace in it. Peace in the emptiness. You want to know what peace is? It's an empty mind. Peaceful. So we come here in the morning, group of people. Now we're all working together, inclining to Nibbana. We're, it's a corporate group, not just one person alone. Now there's a group of people, a Sangha of meditators. All our differences and opinions, views, backgrounds, probably these are relinquished, not made much of here in, say, for our, say, giving up to the group, of being, being with the group, being part of the group, so that in this way the group endeavor <coughs> helps, helps to support us, we can watch ourselves. We're not pulling each other apart, so we, we have some kind of always kind of busy trying to relate to each other in this way and that way, or fight each other off, or, or get carried away with the things that people can do with each other. We aren't doing that now. We're just conforming to a code, to a standard, the precepts. So we have time now. We can sit here and meditate watch ourselves rather than carry on this way, that way with each other. There's an opportunity now to give each other the space and the support by just physically being here. We help each other and we have this opportunity to meditate and reflect. And we recollect qualities of the Buddha, the enlightened one, the one who knows, the perfected one, the pure, all these kind of qualities we, we, we uh, reflect on the Buddha, the one that's gone beyond, not deluded by anything, knows things as they are, knows the unknown as the unknown, knows the known as the known, there's the conditions, you know, the, the unconditioned, not deluded by them, it's not fascinated or repelled. The Buddha, the Dhamma, here and now, imminent, something we must turn to, reflect on, look at, be with. By being, by being that knowing, that Buddha knowledge and wisdom, we know the Dhamma, the truth. Unconditioned, not bound by time. not an object of sense, not a thing or an entity. And then the Sangha, the refuge in Sangha, in virtuousness, doing good, refraining from doing evil things, practicing earnest endeavor to realize truth. And then we chant the uh, teaching of the Buddha, the Pei Sankarani Cha Sapi Tamana Ta. All conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma is not self. Then we chant the four requisites for the lowest standard of living. Reflect on it. Today you have a 
you have uh, something to wear good enough you don't have to go out and buy clothes today or what you have will protect you keep you from keep you warm enough if they don't if they don't have all these blankets here <laughs> So today you don't need to go out buying clothes. You know what you have now. Um, if you don't, if you, we can maybe find a few rags they throw away and give to you. Then <laughs> <laughs> uh, next one is food. The food's all here. Perhaps the uh, they prepares it very nicely. We have good food enough to for our needs for the day. Then uh, place to live, shelter over the head keeps us protected from the rain, and medicine for illness. <laughs> so you. You have, that's good enough, I'm safe. The basic necessities, requisites are adequate. Then the sharing of merit. Dedicate the merit. Realization, anything good coming from your practice, may this benefit all sentient beings. Keep reflecting that how that doing this kind of thing is a great benefit to all beings. When an arahant arises in the world, is it for the welfare of all beings? It's like it's a wonderful thing when there are, are enlightened beings in the world. To think if this world didn't have any enlightened beings, what a mess it would be. And it's pretty messy now, but there's still a few enlightened beings in it. That's what keeps it from blowing up. If there were, if all the enlightened beings died out, oh. <coughs> horror, horror show. Because of, there are still a few enlightened beings, the world manages to not get, it just manages to keep out of that. And the more enlightened beings there are, of course, the more chances we have of, of living in a decent way with each other. Solving the problems, economic, political, social problems. You need enlightened beings, wise beings, not just selfish, deluded kind of human beings. And all they do is create turmoil, conflict, subvert everything. <coughs> So, there's still enlightened beings existed in the world. So it's, it is, as long as that, as long as there is that, it's, the world will be, well, it will be manageable. And then if there are more enlightened beings, it will be much better. So that means, maybe, you should get enlightened. <laughs> and wait for somebody else to do it. <laughs> can hardly wait till somebody else is enlightened to ease the tension in the world. <laughs> uh, maybe you should do it. You ever think of that? Say, wait for somebody else to do it. So the sharing of merit is, uh, is our reflection on our intimate connections with all sentient beings then our that we can be we must be responsible for how we live for the welfare of all beings and that enlightenment is is our natural right and heritage to be enlightened it's not something some kind of freak thing in nature but it's what we all must move toward, be, 
rather than just settling for ignorance, fear and desire. And then the last one is the metta practice that I talked about last night, kindness. This kindness, loving kindness, friendliness, and we start with ourselves. So now if you'll sit good posture. Now, metta, some people think, is, is just thinking good things about others. May all beings be happy. Those kind of chants are just to remind us of, of actually being that, that, being kind in a practical way. Not just right now at this time, we can, we can be kind to the situation we're in, to ourselves, to our own body, to each other. Which means that, doesn't mean that we like, have to like it or approve, but we can be kind, we can accept the present situation as it is. <coughs> Have a kindness, willingness to allow things to be as they are, if, if we can't, if the allow conditions to be this way without creating aversion or hating them, wanting it to be otherwise. But just your own physical, mental condition at this time, that metaphor, it means to be at peace with it. Just be with it. Observe the kindly peaceful way with the way things are at this moment. 